card is here. Um, so. Okay, we're going to go. Ahead, yeah, we're going to go ahead and get started, and um, we're going to hopefully finish up the section on uh, the brain and spinal cord today. And are there any questions on anything? Oh, how badly did everybody do on the previous exam? What was the average? I don't know. I didn't look. Oh. Um. You know, I mean, I don't sit around and look at, look at the averages. You know. well, it seemed like a good portion of us were demoralized. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll I will take a look at it now. It, okay, it was awful. You. So that was, was on. I was curious. If, like, that, was on, that was on the um, bone and muscle. Yes. Okay. Which is really strange. That's one of the easiest. Uh, what? Historically, I mean, yeah. historically, it's been one of the easiest exams. The first test was the easiest. Really, that's usually the one that everybody tanks because they don't know what to expect. Yeah, I think this one. Well, I'll I'll take a look. You know, there's tanking and then there's tanking. No, I think it was tanking. I'll take a look. I mean, I have people that if they get a 98, they say, oh, I take, I failed the exam. No, 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 no. Okay. I will, I will take your, I will take your, I'll take your concern seriously and take a look at it. So, okay. Greatly appreciate that. So does anybody else have any comments? Okay. So. It gave me a headache because when I submitted it, I'm like, okay, felt pretty confident. And I'm like, well, never mind. I don't feel so confident. Yeah, we saw our grades and I felt so confident after that test. Okay. okay. Well, well. Okay. Let's move on and talk about something more interesting than grades. Um, sure. And we are talking about structures within the brain. And I think this is the last thing we talked about was the cingulate gyrus. And this is appropriate for this morning because the cingulate gyrus is the structure that allows us to deal with frustrations. It uh, allows us to um, deal with conflicts when we get frustrated. You know, some ways, sometimes we work, work through the conflict and we deal with our frustrations appropriately, and other times we just throw things. Either way, and either way is the cingulate gyrus in play here. Um, demonstrating your emotions through gestures is the cingulate gyrus. Flipping somebody off or being flipped off is the cingulate gyrus for whatever reason. You're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off and you just want to wave at them and only use one finger because you're tired you know so and it happens we've been on the giving and receiving end of that for as long as we can probably remember uh, that is a type of it's the cingulate gyrus which sits right above the top of the limbic system is telling us you know we feel better we do it because it, it gives us a brief burst of dopamine and we feel a little better because now we've resolved this frustration. You know, it's like somebody beeps, beeps the horn at you in traffic. There's frustration there. You know, it may be the 10th car down in the line behind you, but now you know, you know that they're beeping at you, you know, and you know that you can't go because there's four cars in front of you, but you know they're beeping at you. So you're frustrated. And you respond to that. Um, you know, you um, are trying to put something together and you're frustrated. 
you're trying to assemble something and you're frustrated. Um, and you, you know, depending on your tolerance for really bad directions, you throw things. So um, it allows us to express our emotions in a good way and in a bad way. This is what the singulate gyrus does for it. It is the other, you know, it's the other key part of the limbic system. Remember the limbic system, you know, it uses the hippocampus for memories. It uses the amygdala to trigger our fear response, you know, so that we remember how to respond when we should be afraid. You know, how do we respond in an emergency? The, the amygdala brings all into play. It recognizes a dangerous situation, says, here's what we got to do in this situation and eventually triggers fight or flight because you recognize the situation is dangerous. Um, without the cingulate gyrus, we can get into all sorts of trouble too. We would, we would store up all of this, this emotions and we would not have a healthy release. So these are the two key, the amygdala for recognizing fear and the cingulate gyrus for dealing with frustrations and emotions. We, we need them, but we try to keep them in check the, as we'll see here in a minute, the prefrontal cortex, the front of our frontal lobe, helps us deal with things logically. Unfortunately, the logic side and the emotional side are always butting up against each other because some things we try to do logically and some things we do emotionally. And we try, we try to strive for some sort of balance between that, but sometimes we just go one way or the other. Now. Moving on, the motor areas of our brain. Motor areas are located in the, what we call the precentral gyrus. Now the central sulcus is the divider between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobes. Uh, the central sulcus is located, let's see, oh, this will work in this one. Uh, the central sulcus, let me, show you on the brain exactly where it is. Um, okay, this is, this is the frontal lobe. This just can't really work for me better, but let's try it. There we go. We have the frontal lobe here, and this groove, this groove right here, this groove is the central sulcus. The central sulcus separates the parietal lobe from the, the parietal lobe back here from the frontal lobe up here. Everything in the frontal lobe is motor. Everything behind the central sulcus is sensory. And so the, um, the, the central sulcus is this big divider. It's a landmark. And the two ridges uh, on either side of the central sulcus, we have what's known as the um, pre-central, the pre-central gyrus here, and the post central gyrus here, because the sulcus is this big groove right in the middle. So what happens in the pre-central gyrus is motor. What happens in the post central gyrus is sensory. And let's go back to share screen. Okay. So we have these two big ridges right on either side, one on either side of the central sulcus, this big groove, the divider between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobes. And in the pre-central gyrus, the ridge in front of the groove, it's the best way I can say it, is the, what we call the primary motor cortex. Remember the cortex is only the, is the last four millimeters, the edge of the hemisphere. And the primary motor cortex originates motor actions to all of our skeletal muscle. Raise my right arm, lower my right arm. You know, pick up my phone, put my phone back down, raise my right leg, lower my right leg. Those are all controlled on each side of the, in each hem, on both hemispheres. There's a pre, pre-central gyrus on the left side and the right side controlling the, the various parts of the, of the skeletal muscle in the body. Now they originate the motor activity they will eventually send signals down the spinal column, spinal cord, to reach the muscles of the arms and the legs and the hands and feet or whatever. Their actions are sort of rough. The signal is sort of rough. It hasn't been refined yet. Behind the uh, primary 
premotor cortex. I'm sorry, actually, well, actually, in front of the premotor of the primary motor cortex is the premotor. So if the um, primary is in the precentral gyrus, the, the premotor is in front of that, head, you know, as, we, as we're heading towards the tip of the brain. Bless you. And so what is the, um, what does the premotor do? The premotor deals with learned skills. Both of these are going to be pretty raw information. So the, the uh, primary is like raise your arm. Okay. Now, before we can get it out to raising our arm, we've got to send that through the um, uh, basal ganglia to deal with competing uh, muscle sets. We have to run it through the cerebellum. So the cerebellum can refine it because that's what the cerebellum does. The cerebellum takes the raw signal from the, from the cerebral cortex and processes it, processes it so that we can have it the most efficient way possible, the smoothest, the cleanest motion. The, the, the basal ganglia is busy, you know, blocking competing actions so that you can have a nice refined motion here. The, the uh, cerebellum is telling you, well, you've done this a million times, here's how you do it. So that you get a nice, smooth, effortless, efficient motion. The premotor cortex deals with patterned skills, riding a bicycle, driving a car, applying your brakes when necessary, flipping somebody off, you know, in the most efficient way possible. Um, the um, things that you practice and practice and practice, sports, um, video games. You generally, if you're playing different types of video games, you generally get better with practice. And, you know, one would hope that there's a point to that, that you would get better with practice. You get better, you become a better driver the more you drive. You get better at sports. Yeah. Now, granted, there are limits. Yeah, there are limits. We're, we're not all going to go practice, you know, playing a sport and get better and better and better at it till we could eventually become a professional. Most of us have some sort of inherent limitations to, you know, our skills. But there are some people that ha have a little bit more skill, a little bit more muscle mass, a little bit more muscle memory. Because, you know, the, the difference between a, <clears throat> a professional athlete and the average person, <clears throat> as far as skills and strength and stuff like that, is not that different. You know, it's not that we're not that far apart. They're just a little bit faster, a little bit stronger, just a little bit, but enough to make a difference. Well, it's like two cars being side by side. One's going one mile an hour faster. It's going to move ahead at one mile per hour. Exactly. Exactly. You know. You know it, that that's the difference there. You know, their professional athletes are just a little bit better at what they do. And that makes all the difference in the world. But the premotor cortex tells us how to do things and keep doing it better and better. We, we, so we, we take advantage of our muscle memory in the cerebellum. You know, whether you're playing an instrument, using your keyboard, uh, driving a car, playing sports, uh, whatever you like to do that you have, that you practice a lot at, you do it over and over again. You know, some things like walking. You know, we learn how to, now that's a, a real basic skill, but we learn how to walk very early on in life and we get better at it. You know, somewhere around four or five years old, we stop falling down, you know, um, when we walk. You know, we, we're, not as, we're not as clumsy as we were when we were uh, younger because we get better at it, you know, and you know, we just, perhaps we get so, so much better that we become a, uh, a runner, maybe we run, we run for maybe we like to run. That becomes our sport. You know? So anyway, premotor cortex gives us all this repetitive actions, learned actions, skills, things that we like to do. You know, if you like to um, uh, if you like to cook, if you like to work with wood, if you paint anything that you get better and better at, you know, to within our, to our limits anyway. That's the premotor area. We still have to refine all this through the basal ganglia, 
we still have to refine it from the cerebellum. So also in the frontal lobe, we have the frontal eye field and we have Broca's area. The frontal eye field controls the movement of our eyeballs. Those six extrin extrinsic muscles that surround the eye are controlled by the frontal eye field. They help us to respond to signals from the substantial, uh, not the substantial, but the uh, corporate quadrigemina. Uh, when we respond to a you know, motion at the edge in our peripheral vision, uh, it helps us to respond to different stimuli. We look, we're always looking around and moving our eyes. <clears throat> we, depending on the stimulus, depending on what we're reading or text on a screen or uh, on a piece of paper, we're tracking that along. It's these, the frontal eye field allows us to move our head and move our eyeballs. It is <clears throat> sort of at the, the junction of the, uh, of the premotor cortex and the primary motor cortex. Directly below it is Broca's area. Now Broca's area <coughs> is our speech producing area. We can talk, we can manipulate sounds with our tongue, our teeth, our lips, and our vocal cords. Broca's area allows us to take, produce words. And, and sounds, we can, but it's only on the left-hand side of the brain. It's not on both sides. This is one of those, the speech areas and the speech comprehension areas are found only on the left-hand side. This is a good indicator. If a person can't speak after suffering some sort of trauma, you know, uh, to the head, or if they've experienced a stroke, if they can't speak, the damage is on the left-hand side because that's the only side where speech production it, uh, occurs. So it's a good, it, it's a real good indicator. Well, they can't talk, so there must be some sort of damage along in here. So um, this is in the, you know, this is the other, these are the two other motor areas that are found in the frontal lobe. Okay. Yeah. Sensory. And remember that most of our brain is association. So motor and sensory don't take up a whole lot of, you know, of, of collectively uh, motor, input, motor output and sensory input amounts to about 1% of the use of all the neurons in our brain. Everything else is association. So the sensory areas in, our, in, our cor in the cortex, we have what's known as the primary somatosensory cortex. That is in the post central gyrus, the ridge right behind the central sulcus. We have the somatosensory association cortex telling us what we're feeling here, that, telling us what we're receiving in the somatosensory cortex. Most of these uh, sensory uh, areas are gonna have association areas wrapped around them to tell us what we are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or uh, balancing. The association areas are much larger than the cortex area themselves because the association areas give us all the knowledge and memory to interpret what the sensory input is. Okay, primary somatosensory cortex right behind the central sulcus that is in the post central gyrus. Uh, we get input from the skin and from the proprioceptors in here telling us what's going on. Are we hot? Are we cold? Does it hurt? Uh, are we being touched by something? Uh, are, are our muscles contracting? Where, where am I in space right now? All that stuff is coming in to the primary somatosensory area. There's still nothing but action potentials. That's all they are, action potentials coming in. They've been through the thalamus and now they've gone to this uh, somatosensory cortex. We have no idea what they mean. If we were to stop at the cortex, the somatosensory cortex, we would just have these action potentials coming up there from all the different sensory receptors. We, would, we still have no idea what they are. In other words, we probably wouldn't be aware of them because we would not perceive them. 
but it's the association area that wraps itself around us. The association area is behind it and under it and takes all of the sensory input and processes it so that we know what's going on. The somatosensory <clears throat> association cortex tells us what we're touching or feeling. It tells us where we are in space. It, it takes all this input from all the different sensory receptors that are being stimulated and tells us what's going on. We get a comprehensive picture. If you had damage to the association area, you would not be able to interpret or perceive what's, what's going on. You would not be aware of the pressure of the, the, the chair on your back or the, the itch from the tag in the back of your collar or anything else uh, from uh, the skin or from the proprioceptors. They, the signals would be being sent and they'd be received in the cortex, but the association area, if it was damaged, wouldn't be able to tell you what it was. The, um, the association area allows you to determine what something is in your pocket without having to look at it. I can, I don't have to pull my wallet out to say, oh, that's what that is. It was in my pocket because I can tell what it is by its shape or, you know, cha loose change. If you have a, uh, some loose change in your pocket, you don't have to pull all the change out to find a quarter or a dime. You're trying to use the vending machine and you, you have just enough change to get something, you know, and for whatever reason. You don't have to, oh, there's a quarter because a quarter and a nickel are somewhat close together. A penny and a dime are somewhat close together. Damage in the association area would cause you to pull stuff out to look at it because you couldn't tell by touch or shape. That's what the association area does. It tells you what things are without having to look at it. So this is very important for us. You know, you're, you're getting your keys out, you find your house key or your car key, you know, uh, like I've got three keys I have to use uh, in here and the door key and the office door key have each have a separate key. <clears throat> and so I keep them organized. I have three keys. I know the key in the middle is my office door. I don't have to go reading the number on it to know that because I just can tell the position. But if my association area was damaged, I'd have to take the, take the keys, bring them up, look at it and say, there it is, number 21. I don't know why it's 21. That's number, that's lock is number 21. And the fact that it's in the middle, I wouldn't be able to determine that without looking at it. So anyway, okay. The visual cortex is the most important cortex in our, in our central nervous system. All of our visual input, all the action potentials from the retina uh, end up in the visual cortex, but they don't mean anything. They pass through the uh, thalamus. You can see that on the, on the uh, diagram there, there's the thalamus there. The optic tract goes into the thalamus and it's all routed to the visual cortex in the back of the occipital lobe. Back in here is the largest cortex area. Action potentials end up back there. If the visual cortex were damaged, we would be blind. We would not be able to receive the signals. Now surrounding that is the visual association area. And the visual association area is the largest of the association areas. It tells us what those action potentials mean. It tells us what we're seeing. It tells us that, that the sky is blue. There's a red truck out there. The stoplight just turned yellow. There's a school bus uh, coming in front of you. You know, it tells you, uh, you know, you know, everything. We are, we are visually oriented. It tells us all that. The action potentials don't tell us a thing <clears throat> except that they're action potentials, that the photoreceptors have been stimulated <clears throat> to the point of threshold and we have an action potential. But it's the association area that draws in our memories, 
and our knowledge and our skills and tells us, oh, that's what, okay, there, we got a yellow light. And then that sets us down a series of pathways that we can follow. And it's all situational. You know, if it's a yellow light and you're 200 feet from the light, what do you do? Well, you know, most of us don't try to run it from that far away. Uh, if you're 10 feet away, well, obviously you're gonna go through unless there's a car in front of you to decide suddenly to stop, which they could because they do things. We all do strange things. Um, we all have the, the, what the visual information tells us is gonna dictate our responses. But again, it, we have to interpret everything. This is where we see. This is how we, this is exactly where we see. And if we damage the association area, then our eyes are gonna work and the spinal and the, and the optic nerve is gonna work and the optic tract's gonna work. And we're gonna have no clue what we're looking at because we can't interpret it. The eyeballs will work, but the association area doesn't. So there's no comprehension in here because otherwise the action potentials, here they come and they don't mean a thing. So we can't interpret it. Perception, perception that occurs depends on interpreting the signals. Unless we know what, what the signal, what the action potentials mean, we have no clue. Okay. The auditory cortex also has, is, is in the temporal lobe. It also has an association area telling us what we're hearing. It's on the temporal lobe near the lateral sulcus. There's a sulcus right along in here. And we process the, you know, the, the, the um, action potentials from the uh, cochlear, from the cochlea and the auditory nerve portion of, of, the, uh, of the nerve are sending action potentials to us. And we're receiving them in the auditory cortex and the association area tells us what we're hearing. It allows us to recognize words. It allows us to recognize sounds. It allows us to pick out melodies and recognize uh, patterns of music. It allows us to hear highs and lows and mid ranges. This is all the association area at work. But what the cortex is receiving is nothing but action potentials. We can interpret the sounds, we can remember the sounds, we remember the melody of many pieces of music. Lots and lots of pieces of music. The melodies, we, we recall them, we hear them, and like, oh, I know what that is. You know, we recognize that some are, are universally recognizable. Uh, you know, if, because uh, for example, if I say the happy birthday song, which is ridiculous, so, but now you're going to start saying, oh, oh, how about this one? This is even worse. You'll hate me for this. How about it's a small world after all? And if you don't start, that doesn't start running through your head and thinking about that big, ugly mouse in Florida, you know. You know. So um, we, get, we get music stuck in our heads, you know. And I hope you're all thinking of that at this point. So there, see? Um, I hope your singulate gyrus doesn't flare up on that one. So anyway, hmm? oh, she, 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 are you singing along? Well, see, I know, you know, but that's the point. Yeah. Oh, don't worry. It's stuck in my head too now. And I've done it to my, it's self, it's self inflicted now. But the point is, though, that you recognize that. You all recognize, we all recognize it. We remember and interpret sounds. We remember and interpret all sorts of sounds. You hear an ambulance siren, you hear a siren behind you. And there's three choices, ambulance, fire, or police. Okay. Uh, and you um, respond. Most of us look for the, which way they're coming and pull over. Most of us, not everybody. Um, but that's, that's a response. Yeah. Well, if you don't, you know, and if you don't hear it, if you don't hear the sound, then it's because you're not perceiving it. Cause you still have to interpret what that sound is. And you have to remember what that sound means. So, okay. Olfactory cortex, 
in the frontal lobe, just, just above the eye orbits, there, uh, the olfactory epithelium is located at, this, uh, at the superior surface of the nasal cavity. Uh, it's covered with a layer of mucus uh, because all odors have to, you know, all the, the molecules in odors have to dissolve in, in water before they can be processed. And they, we uh, have these branches of the olfactory nerve going up into the uh, brain, into the olfactory bulb. Remember the sheep had huge olfactory bulbs, ours are much smaller. And we send those signals up there and then we interpret what the action potentials mean. And we recall odors. We can, re we can remember up to 10,000 different odors. Some are pleasant, you know, uh, things being baked or cooked, uh, flowers or, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, salt water, like at the beach, you know, the, things like that, or, or the, you know, pine, uh, pine woods, for example, those, those are pleasant odors too, you know, all sorts of pleasant odors, unpleasant odors, garbage, trash, um, dead animals, you know, uh, skunks, you know, we've all, you know, we've all, who hasn't smelled a skunk this, you know, in this past spring, you know, February is, for whatever reason is skunk mating season, which is why you find so many of them dead on the road, you know, because you're not thinking about traffic at that point. Um, the, um, we recognize the odor. We have action potentials that occur uh, and, and are, that are generated and are then interpreted in the uh, association area. The cortex receives the signal the association area tells us what it is. It also ties, you know, odors and memory and emotions are tied in together. We have visceral emotions. Well, that smells terrible. What is that awful odor? We also have pleasant odors. We, we remember, we recognize the odor as a, as a very, very, you know, we smell flowers, you know, or roses or- your mom's perfume. Hmm? Mom's perfume. Exactly, your mom's perfume. You know, uh, we recognize those as, as, as pleasant odors and that triggers a, a positive memory with a positive emotion. Or we have, a, you know, the visceral response to something unpleasant. Uh, we, odors can trigger a whole pathway of memories. You know, it isn't just about grandma's biscuits, you know, for, for good or for bad. Uh, Cause you maybe you love grandma's biscuits uh, and hated grandma. You know, or maybe grandma couldn't bake worth a darn and uh, her biscuits were always horrible, but you still loved her. Or maybe you didn't like her at all and you hated her biscuits too, you know. And they found her laying there in the dining room floor, pelted to death with biscuits, you know, so I don't know. But there's still good or bad emotions triggered with odors and memories. It all ties together. Now, the taste and balance, gustatory is taste and vestibular is balance. Now, the gustatory cortex and its association area is at the juncture of the uh, parietal lobe and temporal lobe. And so we recall different, different, different sensations of foods, uh, some foods we like, some foods we don't. A lot of uh, determining whether we like the food or not has to deal with its texture as well as its taste. Uh, when I was a kid, I never ate beans. I couldn't stand the, the mushiness of, of, the, of, of, of the fiber of the bean. Uh, you know, or I didn't like uh, broccoli because it was just like I'm eating leaves, you know, type of thing, or, or tree branches or something. Um, the, uh, we also have certain, certain flavors. You, know, you, you like certain things and you don't like certain things. Some people like chocolate and some people don't. Um, it's a flavor and we recognize the flavor. And uh, if the flavor is pleasurable, we enjoy it. If it's, if it's unpleasant, we don't like it. So now uh, balance is found in the insula. That's that, that fifth lobe that's sort of buried below the uh, temporal and parietal lobe on the side. And so our cortex and association there area 
for all about balance and equilibrium are found in there because we still retain the memory of what is up and what is down. That whole remember the writing reflex that we raise our head up in the proprioceptors so you know that so we can know our find our, our visual horizon. That's part of the memory of how to do that. It's all controlled in the association area of the insula. We have a lot of association. 99% of our brain is uh, the central nervous system is association. They're all multipolar neurons. The, um, the, the somatosensory area puts signals together so we can tell what we're touching or what's touching us. It interprets it. The visual area allows us to recognize and process so we can determine our next action. The auditory association area is an area called Wernicke's area. It is further back on the left-hand side, almost to the occipital lobe. This is where Wernicke's is located. Um, there we go. Wernicke's is right about here, almost the occipital lobe. Wernicke's lets us comprehend words. It isn't enough to be able to speak the word. That's what Brokus does. Wernicke's allows us to comprehend what we're hearing, comprehend what we're seeing in a written word, and comprehend how, and allow us to put together words that make sense. A person with damage to Wernicke's may not be able to comprehend what you're saying to them. What, what they're producing to say something may come out totally different. It may be, you know, nonsense speak, for example. Uh, what they write out may be nonsense, you know, and they can't read something written to you. you know, your patient may be unable to speak, but they can still write. They can communicate with notes. Okay, Broca's area is damaged but Wernicke's is intact. If they can speak, but it comes out as complete nonsense, then Broca's is intact, but Wernicke's is likely damaged. Example, a uh, number of years ago, uh, a good friend of mine that I've, I've known since I was a kid, his, his mother had a stroke and it, she survived the stroke, but she was in her uh, hospital room and she, was, you know, she hadn't been discharged yet. And she, uh, they were, the, um, they were you know, doing whatever they, they do, you know, uh, assessing her damage in her brain and stuff like that. And she kept telling the attendant that was in there with her that it was going to rain. It was going to rain really soon. And it was a day like today. Well, of course, they ignored what she was saying because you know, she had a stroke and she was, she was not quite coherent. But she kept saying, it's going to rain really soon. What she was trying to say was that her bladder was full and she really had to pee. But what she was, what was coming out was, it's going to rain. And a few minutes after she said it, then she ended up emptying her bladder, you know, in the, in the hospital bed. Simply because what she was trying to say, uh, can you imagine the frustration level? What's it, what is up here saying, I need a bedpan right away because I got to pee. Uh, but what's coming out is, I think it's going to rain. So how are you going to respond to that? You know, uh, and she's getting more and more frustrated as this is going on. And you know, it tells you right away that Wernicke's has got something wrong with it. Now, uh, I never did find out how bad, you know, uh, whether she could uh, communicate uh, by notes. I mean, apparently she did recover from the, from the stroke, so it, it wasn't... Uh, that big a deal for her eventually. But Wernicke's controls the ability to comprehend written and spoken word. So how it comes out of your mouth or how you hear it or how you write it out or try to read it. Uh, all, you know, just because, you know, all levels of Wernicke may or may not be affected at the same time. The damage may be temporary. It may be permanent uh, if they can speak, but it doesn't make sense suspect Wernicke's if they can write, but can't, but can't speak, you know, you got two, two 
uh, communication areas in the brain in the left hand side. Yeah. If they can speak clearly, but it's nonsense, it means that Broca's is okay, but Wernicke's has got something going on. You know, that's going to lead to further types of evaluation or testing with, you know, usually an MRI uh, to find out what's going on. So the Gnostic area gives you a comprehensive, it's a nice way of saying the overall picture. The ability to sit in here or stand in here right now and say, it is Tuesday morning, it's almost 12, we're in the middle of class, it's a nice day, it's, you know, we're about two thirds of the way through April, the semester's about to wind down. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I wish I got more sleep last night. All these things are giving us a comprehensive picture of where we are and what we're doing. We know exactly where we are, for good or for bad. We have a, we have a, a very good understanding. That's what the, this, this Gnostic area is, where we put everything together for a comprehensive picture. What's going on right now? Including, it also includes what we're planning to do later on, or what we did this morning, what we're going to do tonight, what we're, you know, what we've got planned for the rest of the week. All that is part of the comprehensive picture. Now, the other, the, you know, we mentioned this, the premotor area uh, is more of an association area than anything else in, in the motor area, because that's where we have the skill memory in there. You know, when we say that you never forget how to ride a bicycle among, and other things. Yeah. These areas, this information, once learned is stored there and stored in the cerebellum, and it takes a great deal of damage to lose that. We may have to relearn how to walk. We may have to relearn how to brush our teeth. We may have to re relearn how to dress ourselves. But those, those, these are skills that we learn and are stored in the premotor area for us. And then the frontal eye field. Yeah. Again, the ability to how, you know, it isn't just the ability to move our eyes, but how do we read something? You know, most of us read from, you know, the upper left and go to the bottom right of a page. When we read on it, when we're looking at a website, we go from the top and scan all the way down. And, you know, a lot of times we'll cut, to the, you know, try to cut to the chase and get to the bottom to see the, you know, see the summary or the factoid instead of trying to blast through, you know, all the, all the information there. So we use the frontal eye field to tell us how to, you know, get the fact out that we want, find the information we want. If we're looking for, you know, uh, you know, the, the author of the paper, we go to the top. If we're looking for the central point, we go to the summary. We don't read the whole thing if that's not necessary. Okay. The uh, cortex does an amazing job for us in dealing with all this multiple, these multiple sensory areas. You know, we, um, the cortex does both sensory and motor. We've seen, I've just walked you through this. This slide's probably, now this will work. Um, the cortex, cerebral cortex at outer four millimeters lets us respond to things as they happen but also plan ahead and also remember things we've done in the past. So hopefully we, we, we learn from our mistakes. We don't relive our mistakes. We plan new activities. You know, the cortex enables us to be who we are. It gives us our sensations. It gives us our thoughts. It gives us our personality. It gives us our emotions. And we, the cerebral cortex is broken up into three distinct areas as far as association goes. The anterior association, the posterior association, and in the middle of all that, we have the limbic association. We've talked about the limbic system. We have the limbic association area. So the anterior area is called the prefrontal cortex. This is where we talk about the prefrontal lobe right here prefrontal lobe. It is the most sophisticated of all the cortices that we deal with. 
it is where our intellect is located. That's our knowledge and skills, our cognition, our awareness of things around us, our ability to recall events and apply them to where we are now and our personality. It is where our conscience is located. It's where our sense of right and wrong is located. It's how we respond in social settings. Uh, it gives us our working memory. Uh, it allows us to look at things in an abstract way. You know, if you are looking at uh, a set of instructions on how to put assemble something, you can look at that and depending on your skills, you can assemble it correctly just by looking at the picture or other people need to read the directions. You know, there's two types of people. They're visual learners and there's written learners, learners the, the kinesthetic type learners. They have to see it. You know, they have to follow the written instructions. Others can just look at it and say, oh, I can do it this way, you know? And, you know, people that are visual uh, can assemble things quickly. Whereas people that are, have to have the written word can also assemble things quickly. And both sides are correct. Persistence planning, reasoning, all this is in the prefrontal cortex. This is where we grow as a person. We are exposed to, behave, to feedback from our behavior. When we're children and we experience, express bad behavior, there's usually some sort of punishment phase involved here or corrective action phase so that we learn not to do that again. One of the first things we learn as children is the word fair, usually expressed as that's not fair. You know, uh, we are very, very precise as children as what is fair. You know, did you get a bigger piece of cake than I did? You know, so, uh, you know, or you got to stay up longer than, than uh, I did. That's not fair, you know, or it's not fair to tell, to take my, uh, you know, Nintendo away from me, whatever, you know, uh, device, you know, or, or my phone. You know, that's not fair. We learn fairness early on. Not probably in the best, best skills there. But we also learn our sense of right and wrong. You know, what is appropriate behavior and what isn't? We socialize. We start the social, socialization process, learning to speak this morning. Um, it starts very early on in life and it continues. We grow and adapt as we go through elementary school, through junior high or middle school and then high school and then off to college and working with people. And the mistakes that we make early in life, hopefully we don't make them again. And, you know, we all have experiences of, boy, I wish I hadn't done that, you know, at some point in, our, in, in your life, so. The association, th this is where we are located in the prefrontal cortex right here. Damage to this area affects our personality. It affects our ability to initiate uh, actions and respond to stimulus. Um, you know, it was once thought that people that, had, uh, that were schizophrenic or were antisocial or were criminals could be treated correctly by altering their prefrontal cortex. There is a, a process known as a frontal lobotomy, where a very large bore needle was inserted right beside the eyeball and stuck up into the brain and wiggled around a little bit and then pulled out and then see how the, how the patient responded. And usually what would happen is they would become very docile. They would no longer exhibit uh, their antisocial behavior or their criminal, their violent criminal tendencies. On the other hand, though, they would not be able to initiate any kind of activity. They would respond, they would communicate, but they would not be able to initiate. So, and it's amazing that that kind of treatment was still considered acceptable probably into the early 1960s. And we're talking like really large needles that just jam it up right beside you. You know, it goes in through the uh, optic foramen right into their frontal lobe and just wiggle till they stop squiggly, you know, around. So uh, I would hope that they were at least anesthetized when they did that. So anyway, 
So this is probably the most important area of, the, of all the three cortices. Now, damage in the prefrontal cortex can really alter the per, a person's behavior. A tumor there, a, a lesion damage, uh, they may lose their sense of uh, right and wrong. They may lose their conscious, their sense of uh, conscience. They may lose their inhibitions. Um, you know, they may lose attentiveness. They may no longer care about social uh, standards. You know, uh, you know, we see a little bit of that when people drink too much, for example, uh, and they lose their inhibitions. You know. Uh, but that, then it, but that they come back. Um, but if there's permanent damage, if there's a tumor growing in there, one of the signs is an alteration of their personality or loss of memory. Yeah. So, so the an, the anterior association area, the prefrontal cortex, is, you know, if your patient's exhibiting unusual behavior it might indicate something's going on in the prefrontal cortex that shouldn't be there. Now in the posterior area, it's different. In the posterior area, damage in that area um, may, ca may cause your patient to isolate themselves away from their body, meaning they no longer recognize one side of their body as their own. And as the example here, uh, your patient may refuse to clean the left side of their body because that's not mine. They refuse to, they, they don't, they no longer recognize their left side as part of them. So pretty bizarre, but it, it, it happens. So, okay. Now, so the posterior association area, this allows us to give us a more comprehensive picture of sensory input it takes into account all of the association areas in the other in the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobes. It allows us to recognize faces and names and places, and uh, to uh, know where we are located. It allows us to determine patterns, patterns in structures, patterns in sounds, patterns in, and flavors in food. It gives us the ability to recognize a variety of flavors in, in certain types of food, for example, uh, or the subtle odors of a variety of flowers. Uh, it allows us to, you know, Wernicke's is thrown in here too. Wernicke's lets you understand both written and spoken languages. You know, all of this association area, this posterior association area gives you the ability to, again, comprehend where you are. Now, Wernicke's, there's a couple of terms here. Uh, aphasia means the inability to speak. So a person that can't speak is, is suffering from aphasia. Damage to Broca's area renders them with what we call um, uh, non-fluent aphasia. aphasia. Non-fluent aphasia. They can't speak. Non-fluent fluency means to the ability to use words, to speak words. Non-fluent aphasia is the inability to form words, you know, so that they can they just speak nonsense or, or gibberish or mumble. That's non-fluent aphasia. Of the uh, fluent aphasia means that they can't understand spoken or written words. Broca's is going to give you non. It's going to give you non-fluent aphasia, meaning they can't speak. Fluent aphasia means they can't read or hear. So both of them involve uh, the the inability to use or comprehend the, a word. So it's a good indicator of what's going on in their brain. Without having, you know, it's it's the quick and dirty uh, evaluation. You know, they can't speak or but they can they can comprehend. Gives you a pretty good idea right away of at least where the damage is located. Now the limbic association area in the cerebral cortex, uh, it ties in the cingulate gyrus, you know, the frustration areas, 
brings in the fear area in the uh, amygdala. It brings in the hippocampus, uh, giving us uh, the ability to retain memories. Um, this, the limbic association area pulls all this together to give us not just um, the images of things that happened, but the emotions behind it. Things that happened that made you happy, things that happened that made you angry or, or sad. We retain those memories. The limbic system deals with emotions and lots of memories deal with emotions. You know, the concept that, well, I'm gonna go on vacation and make memories. Well, that's nice, but that's not what happens. We don't, set, we don't make memories. Memories are simply uh, the, memories are what happened. Memories are the, the record of what's happened to us while we're doing something. And all that gets stored in the association areas. You know, I'm going to remember my trip to, to Dollywood this morning. Okay, I didn't go to Dollywood this morning, but I'm going to remember that. I'm going to store it because I, I made a memory of that trip. Well, I also end up recalling the drive to Dollywood, the traffic, the lines, the, the price, the really expensive food, and the, the fact that a duck did something inappropriate on my shoulder as it flew overhead. You know, so all that becomes, you know, that's not what I set out to remember when I was making a memory. I wanted to remember to go to Dollywood and meet Dolly. Not really, but you know, you set out with this great memory, this plan to remember to have a great memory. Well, the memory is everything that happens. You can't just chop out the pieces that you, you know, it's not like Philip like trimming a video to where you only get the right part of it that you want to keep and everything else you can throw out. But that's all part of the memory and it triggers emotions. Memories and emotions are interchange of, you know, uh, uh, ir cannot be undone. You're always gonna have emotions from certain memories. Some are good, some are bad, some are indifferent. So. Okay. Uh, the visceral association area and the general association areas are, um, sort of overlay these uh, three areas we talked about. The, um, again, this is gonna deal with how we view all the input at one time. We pull in the, the general association area gives us both visual, auditory, uh, uh, balance, odors, tastes, uh, touches, you know, pressures, pains, things like that, balance from the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the parietal lobe. So we, we leave out the frontal lobe here. And so we know exactly what's going on all the time. The visceral area is a little different. The visceral area lets us deal with things that are unpleasant, things that are that nauseate us. The insula, which deals with equilibrium and balance. Why do you think that, you know, when you become uh, disoriented, you, know, you go on a ride, for example, and you get disoriented. Maybe you get car sick. Uh, maybe you sit in the back seat of the car and you get car sick. Some people do. Maybe you go on a ride at Dollywood and you get off and you're so dizzy that you become violently ill. You know, it may have been, uh, it, it couldn't have been those eight corn dogs and the, uh, um, cheese sticks that you ate earlier, right before you got on the ride. Couldn't have been that. But the point is, though, that the visceral association area interprets balance, but it also allows us to have uh, a, a violent nausea because of that imbalance, too. So good old insula. Okay. So, something else you may have heard of is that people talk about their brains as being left brain or right brain. We've all heard that. Okay, um, you know, it's like, well, that was a left brain idea, or, you know, uh, they're, they do very well in math, they must be uh, right brained or whatever it says up there. There may be, there is some truth to this, but not a lot. 
because many people are a combination of both. You may have great scientific skills, but also have an artistic flair. You may enjoy music of all sorts of types, and yet you have, you're a good writer. You know, uh, you may not be able to do math worth a darn, but you have great tactile abilities. You can assemble stuff. You can do, you understand spatial relationships very well. Uh, you can put, you can pack stuff up. That's a real uh, skill to write home about. But uh, what was it, Tetris, you know, uh, or maybe you, you know, uh, Rubik's Cube keeps making it, it keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. And you see these people that can solve the, you know what I'm talking about, right? They can solve the cube in three seconds or less. And, you know, I'm still taking it out of the package by the time they've solved a dozen of them. Uh, so we have, we're, we are a combination of all this. Uh, a couple of the strange things that do occur though, we know that our speech centers, for example, are only on the left-hand side. If we damage the speech centers, we, we lose the ability to speak. If we damage the same location on the right-hand side where there are no speech centers, we end up speaking in a monotone and we're incredibly boring and we all become English teachers. And no, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Um, I will apologize to all the English teachers. The, the, the point though is that we have little emotion. We've all experienced an instructor like that somewhere. You know, they, they can't speak. Uh, cannot get you excited about what they're talking about. You know. I I said nothing. I said nothing. So. Well, that's cruel. Yeah. That's that's just that's just downright cruel. Tuesday nights, last semester. Oh. For three hours. Oh, that's just that that that's that's unpleasant. You know. No, it's not. Yeah. So. I hope I didn't put you in that class, did I? No. Good. So, okay. Now, memory. Memory is important to us. We have various stages of memory. We have what's known as short term memory, long term memory, and working memory. Working memory is the most fun. That's the here and now. That lets you see that you've got a bottle of some sort of red electrolyte solution uh, there, uh, or that's what you want us to think it is. Uh, and memory lets us know what words mean and the fact that it's 1215 and all, all you know, you know, we look up names, we recognize people's faces, that's working memory. Long-term memory is the stuff that we commit and don't forget, like birthdays and anniversaries and historical events and, and things like that. You know. Hmm? Holidays, yes, exactly, holidays, or <coughs> skills, how to drive, directions, how to get somewhere. <laughs> so, okay, for most people, you know, uh, long-term memory is the stuff that we don't forget. You remember your name? We all remember our name. Okay. Do you remember where you live? Yes. We all remember. No. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I forget how to spell my name. Maybe. We most of us know how know where we where we've lived. You know, all this long-term memory stuff. You know, it is an unlimited storage capacity. It's like a hundred trillion gigabytes of data that we can store in our brains and we can recall as needed. Once we stick something in the long-term memory, it doesn't go away. So it's like, a, I moved out my hometown, I lived there 13 years, mm -hmm. but I still remember the way, I still remember all the back roads. So my dad used to say. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, um, we all, you know, we can go back to our hometowns right now. And unless things have been changed, you still remember all the shortcuts through town. You know, and all the places you used to go. Now, maybe the things aren't always there, but you still retain that. Long-term memory are the last things that we lose, you know, uh, as we age, you know, particularly in your dementia patients. It's the last thing that your dementia patient will lose is, is long-term memory. So, 
Um, Short-term memory is just the opposite. It's little factoids. It's no longer than, a, than the average uh, phone number. You know, that's how much space it takes up in our brain. And it lasts that long. You know, if someone, if you hear a phone number, for example, that you need to call about something, well, call me, here's my number. And in the space it said, here's my phone number. By the time they've done rattling it off, you have like, gone you know we don't remember it you know um or websites we don't remember websites we have to if we're lucky we remember the topic we were looking for so we can go look up the website and go to the location so short-term memory doesn't give us the ability to remember a whole lot and we can remember one thing for a short period of time and then lose it um, if someone says open the left door you can do that and then it's, it's gone. You know, it's not like it's an important thing. You know, uh, this is why cramming for an exam at the last minute doesn't do any good because every time you put a new factoid in, you push out what was already there. The best thing to do is try to, if you're going to be trying to jam something in at the last minute, one thing, one important point. Don't try to do a whole night's worth of review in five minutes you're not going to do it because you're going to keep pushing stuff out one, try to retain one thing and that's all a paragraph long acronym summarizing one of these presentations by just memorizing that long acronym it's one thing but that's not memories that's not short term you're you've committed it to a long-term storage by, because that's repetition how we convert from short term to long term is through repetition you know, if, if you're going to remember one thing, you know, about the prefrontal cortex, but then you, you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, you move from short term to long term. You know, um, you know, it. Um, and so now there's room for something else. Yeah. The ability to convert from short term memory to long term memory revol involves repetition and rehearsal and practice so we can't remember lots of things like phone numbers they're too long yeah. they're 10 digits which is one more number now than it used to be uh, our short-term memory handles about nine little tiny chunks of information phone numbers are 10 digits which is probably the reason why we have trouble with them but consider this Smartphones came out about in, in bulk about 20 years ago. You know, they really uh, started getting popular in, in the late 90s. And, and you know, by, of course, uh, I forget when the first iPhone came out, uh, but uh, they really exploded in the early uh, 2000s. Yeah. So uh, the ability to store phone numbers in a in a and remember that cell phones didn't originate till 1985 so 35 years ago we had no uh cell phones what we had were car phones they were mounted in your car you couldn't take them anywhere yeah it just did have a little a little pedestal between the seats and that was your phone and when the when the when you got one that had a speaker on there that was pretty cool She's like, she's like, you have it so easy. It's just a little thing. I had a car phone. Yeah. And, and the, the original cell phones, believe it or not, were the size of a brick. And that was like in 1990. Well, they, uh, my mom's dad had a bag phone. Yeah, I remember those. Phone well, well, was a bag. How'd you carry that around? The balls. <laughs> yeah. And. But the point of all this was that somewhere in the 90s, they started storing phone numbers. You can store up to 10 phone numbers. Now we can store unlimited. Prior to that, everybody knew everybody else's phone numbers. If you wanted to call her, you had her phone number stored in your head or yours or yours or yours or mine. Um, you know, we all knew everybody's phone numbers. We all knew everybody's addresses. Now we don't have to. It's, What's up the yellow pages? Oh. Yeah, and of course the yellow pages are something that is, doesn't exist much anymore, but 
you know, the, in a, a, a big city would have two or three volumes of information. Now we look it up on, online. Because um, there was a tremendous, if you ever want to know the information that our phones can carry, consider that the yellow pages were something about this thick and they were printed on yellow. That's why they call them yellow pages. And, everybody's and everything in there, yeah. you know. And, but all the important numbers and addresses we carried around in our heads and didn't think about it. Now, we don't bother because it's all on our phones. You know, many people, if I ask you if, you, if if you're asked what your phone number is, sometimes you have to stop and think about it because you don't call yourself. And even when you call somebody, you just press their name, you know, you know uh, or you respond. Most of us text anyway, instead of calling. It's all, you know, the ability, well, what we used to remember, which we can, we can still do. What we used to remember is, 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 isn't there anymore. However, a lot of people um, can still remember phone numbers from when they were kids, back when they didn't have you know, the technology to help us out. Because they had to keep recalling it over time. Right, and, we, and, you know, and because we, we dialed those same numbers, we actually had to use the dial. Or, you know, uh, in my hometown, the, we still, we didn't get touch tones until like I was a senior in high school. So it was like we were the dark ages or whatever. Uh, we had to dial by candlelight, you know, so. So, and it, by using, by the, and the reason we remembered the numbers is because we dialed them all the time, you know, because it's all about repetition. The short-term memory is what we deal with right in, right in front of us, you know. Um, when you're looking up a, a, a fact, you know, and then it goes away. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're when you're buying something uh, online and, and they ask you for the three digit uh, number on the back of your credit card or your debit card, and you have to go look that up because, you know, well, who remembers their credit card number anyway? And who remembers their, uh, the, the security code? Or driver's license number. Yeah, or driver's license number. You know, it's almost kind of dangerous to memorize a security code if you have auto fill for everything else because then you're just going to impulse buy more. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to go through the effort of going through your wallet or, mm -hmm. or get the name out of your car. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, those are those are examples of things that require short term memory, and it's good we have to go look it up, you know. So, um, because we could, you know, you're right, impulse buying, we won't even go there in that. Um, or sort of like a, when you get to class schedule, you have to look at the day you go to classes. Oh, yeah. Well, we all do. For your class room and stuff. You know, I mean, I have to, when I have my schedule, I have to remember which class is meeting at what time. You know, you certainly wouldn't want me to come in and start talking about, you know, the cardiovascular system in great detail. I think we'd all do all this. Well, for a while anyway. Yeah. So now, working memory allows us to deal with things that are happening. Like when, you, how do you drive from point A to point B without getting lost? How do you know where you're going? Uh, what's your next class? You know, uh, what GPS? How do you know how to use the GPS? That's working memory, you know. Uh, I, if I plug my phone in uh, on the dash uh, and I have the, the map come up on the screen, you know, it. Uh, I don't know why Jeep didn't give me a, a, a map already because I get this great map that comes up and I plug my phone into, into the, uh, to the, to my little USB cable. So, okay, fine. I got a map. If I remember to do it, if I remember to take it out of my pocket and put it on the mount and plug it in, then I get a map, but that's working memory. You know, driving your car is working memory, taking a test, in any class is working memory, recalling names and dates and places and events is working memory, you know. So um, working memory, you know, the only thing wrong with working memory is as we get older, the ability to process working memory slows down. We don't get dumb, you know. Old people are not, uh, um, they, um, they don't lose their cognitive skills, it just slows down. And they supplement it with long-term memory that they have over younger people. Right. 
you know, they're busy yelling at you for getting on their lawn, uh, but they, they have all these memories, but they process them slower. So that's why if you're behind an, an elderly driver, they're going to take longer to go somewhere. Or they go fast and they might not. Oh, yeah, either or, one or the other, you know. Um, you know. Yeah. Go! Yes, it's on the bride. Uh, what I, I can't stand are the, the, the tourists that drive down JL Road uh, and they ride their brakes from one end to the other. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I sat there behind them and, I'm, and I play this little game of, can I not touch my brakes the whole time through here? You know, can I hold my speed slow enough to account for them going up and down hills riding? They ride their brakes going up hills figure that one out so and then they go back to Alabama and tell everybody about how steep the mountain road was there in, in Sphere County you know anyway yeah <laughs> they haven't let us do that for a while either you just have a natural right foot okay yeah all right if you got to Tennessee you gotta learn to put your foot to the middle exactly exactly so now categories of memory fact memory names places dates words things like that uh something this is something that your dementia patients often lose they lose the, the ability to recall these facts but it's always the last ones they've learned you know many of your dementia patients can recall exactly what they did 40 years ago but can't remember what they had for breakfast or who served them breakfast or who you are. So they lose the, the last of fact memories. Skill memories, driving, doing work, activities, things from practice. Again, these memories are hard to unlearn. Your dementia patients can drive. You know, um, had a, there was a dementia case, an uh, 85 year old male could drive. The state of Indiana saw fit to give this individual a driver's license at 84 to renew his license at 84. And he would get in his car and drive all over the county and have no idea where he was going and eventually work his way back home. But he never had an accident. But the driving skills were something he'd been doing for 70 years and never lost it. They were some of the last memories to go. All these skill memory and fact memory are all near the association areas. So you can recognize what you're looking at or smelling or seeing or doing. So the hippocampus, the hippocampus doesn't store, doesn't make the memory. The hippocampus is an area near the limbic system. The hippocampus allows you to store the memory, but it doesn't, it isn't the memory maker itself. Damage to the hippocampus would, would alter the ability to store new information, but not lose the old stuff. Anyway, and okay, that is, we'll stop here. Today is Tuesday. We'll finish this up. We just got a few pages left to go. We'll finish this up. And then on Thursday, we're going to go into uh, chapter 13. So we'll wrap this up on on thursday uh and i think the start date for lecture test four i'm going to push it back to thursday um but it's only a few little factoids left here so anyway reminder that there is no lab today lab's over so okay let me get us out of here anybody have any questions on anything oh um so all of the uh, soft tops that are marked as extra credit, those are the ones. Those are the ones, yeah. I so. just want to make sure. It looked like some of them, they kind of look like they're structured as quizzes on e-learn, and then others you just ran through them. Are you able to just monitor that? You're able to tell who's gone through, or we can send you something? When you, when you do one for credit, it shows up in, in uh, the grade area. Okay. So, But I did discover, and I don't know why they're set up like this, okay. you have to do... Uh, it all the way through. Yeah, in one sitting. Yeah, I don't know why it's like that, but you know. So, and I will tell you, there are no soft shocks for uh, AP 